Um, sun shining, uh, a bit chilly, a bit windy, but we'll be okay. On it. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Lysander, one of my few favourite aeroplanes here, and it's favourite for a number of reasons. Um, one is it was a, a really unique design, um, and it did some really special stuff in the war. It had a bit of a full start, and then it went on to do great things in different roles. And it's really a, painted like this. It's a tribute to those brave people that uh, worked in the secret world of taking agents to and from occupied Europe during the war. Um, it didn't start life like that, though. So it started um, as, you know, there's a saying that you always prepare to fight the war you've just fought. Well, they did that in the 30s. So they thought the next war was going to be just like the first one. Trenches, artillery, artillery spotting aeroplanes. So this was designed as the ultimate artillery spotting aeroplane. Um, it was called an army cooperation aeroplane. So it was artillery spot, it could photograph, it could pick up messages with a hook, it could do all that sort of stuff. And in the event, it did none of that. By the end of May 1940, it was obsolete as far as the frontline aeroplane was concerned. And they, they lost a lot in France because they thought the war was going to be like the previous one, and it wasn't. And there is, I think, one recorded uh, victory with the Lysander shooting down an ME 109. So presumably the 109 pilot was having lunch at the time. <laughs> but it's, it is quite a handy aeroplane. Maximum speed is 300 miles an hour, which is not um, not bad for an aeroplane that looks a bit like that. What's clever about it is the designer, a guy called Petter, went against his design principles, which was never put more than two innovations in one aeroplane, and he put a whole bunch in one aeroplane, um, mostly to do with high lift devices. What he's trying to do here is make a monoplane operate like a biplane. So a biplane can land in a very short space um, next to the guns and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Monoplane needs bigger runways. So what he tried to do is build extra lift into this monoplane. And you can see the flaps at the back and you can just see the, the slut on the front of the wing. All that operates automatically. If you fly in a jet airliner now, you'll see exactly the same stuff on your Boeing 737. But in this aeroplane, that happens all automatically. There's no hydraulics, there's no lever in the cockpit. If you fly slow enough, everything just deploys by itself, which is really clever. It does confuse the pilot sometimes. <laughs> because if you're on final approach and all your slaps and flaps are down and uh, you decide you're a bit high and you um, push the stick forward, they'll all retract again, which is not particularly good. So you have to learn, teach yourself to control the flight path without pushing the stick forward and reducing the angle attack. It's the angle attack that makes all that much more. Um, <clears throat> the landing gear is fixed. It's made of a huge slacker like um, spring under all that uh, cladding um, to, to cope with rough airfields. And it's a fairly straightforward aeroplane to actually take off and land. <clears throat> One of the differences is because uh, of when those flaps and snaps, mostly when you fly a tail dragging aeroplane on takeoff, you ease the stick forward and pick the tail wheel up so the airplane's flying level. If you do that in the Lysander, all the flaps retract, so you take twice as much runway. So in this airplane, you'll see it take off with, with the tail on the ground. It just flies off, levitates um, when it's ready. It, um, minimum speed is about 60 miles an hour, and maximum level speed about 170 miles an hour. But like I say, 300 in the guide. Now this particular airplane represents the Special Duties version, which is the one that flew agents in and out of France and places. It has the long-range tank, which more than doubles the fuel capacity. So an airplane like this could fly from the south coast of England down to about Lyon in France, land in a field, do the business, take off again and come home with adequate fuel reserves, which is quite something. This was pre-GPS, of course, and, uh, and they flew at night because they would be shot down if they flew by day, uh, hence the colour. Um, some of them were all black, some of them were mostly black but with light grey upper camouflage. 
they stood out like a sore thumb to night fighters in the winter when there was snow on the ground. <laughs> um, so the way they navigated was um, all done by pre-computation by the pilots and what's called dead reckoning, deduced reckoning of where you must be. Um, and they would have maybe two or three really good fixes planned. So the first one was crossing the French coast. The next one would be crossing a major river, probably the Seine, depending on where they're going. Next one, the Loire. Uh, and there would be some feature on the river, whether an island or a fork or something, that was unique. And they would navigate between those two points. Um, and between the two points, just fly a heading until they saw their fix. Um, if they went into cloud, they just maintained the heading. And when they got to the time, when they should be at the fix, they looked for it. If they were still in cloud, they turned onto the next leg anyway. Um, and then just waited for a break in the cloud. Um, once they got to the final fix, they did a um, what's called a, a, an IP to target run, initial point to target, a, a relatively short leg from a really important fix that you can't mistake, and then you time on a certain heading for a certain amount of time, um, and then you should be over the field. And as they approached the field, the guys on the ground would hear the engine and uh, they would light a torch um, and they would be in Morse code sending a particular letter in Morse that had been agreed um, beforehand with the, those sort of personal messages that went on on the BBC. Um, the pilot would be looking for that letter. If he got the right letter, he would send the appropriate reply. And then the uh, guys on the ground would lay out the landing lights, which were three torches. Um, one where he wanted to touch down, one 200 yards further up into wind, and one 50 yards to the right of that. And he would land by the first torch, the first torch just on his left side, roll between the two, turn right, taxi back to the first torch, turn into wind. He would then draw his revolver and wait to see who came up the steps. <laughs> <laughs> and if he didn't recognize him personally, the brief was to shoot him. I don't think it ever happened. But basically, all the people that were in charge of the landing sites all came to UK and were trained on how to set up airplanes. So the pilots and the guys on the ground knew each other personally. And whilst that was going on, the two agents in the back would throw their bags out. The agents that were coming back would throw their bags in. The agents that were in the cockpit stowed the bags, climbed out. The next two agents that were going home climbed in. It was a well-rehearsed thing that they practiced at Tempsford until they couldn't get it wrong. It would take about a minute and then the airplane was off it. Um, so uh, it was a well-rehearsed um, process. They did lose one or two, um, very rarely to uh, being captured on the ground by the, by the Germans. They were lost through being lost, weather and uh, night fighters. Um, there was a, an apocryphal story that's recorded where an aeroplane stuck in the mud when they landed. Um, so the air crew um, or the pilot was taken away down the escape lines, but the aeroplane was stuck in France, and of course the Germans found it. So the Germans employed some local contractors to tow the aeroplane to the nearest airfield, um, which they duly did. What the Germans didn't realize is the contractors they employed were the guys that were on the field the night before. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, they towed the aeroplane towards the airfield um, where there was a level crossing on the way and their tractor broke down. When the Lysander was on the main railway line between Paris and Lyon and it got destroyed by an express train. Um, so there, there's the Lysander. To fly it's odd, it's quirky. You have to um, use really large forces, particularly in pitch, um, because it's a very stable aeroplane. Um, but it is actually pretty manoeuvrable, and you'll see that in the display hopefully later on. So there we go. That's, uh, I've done my brain dump of Lysander. <laughs> if, if, um, if you have any questions, I'll uh, be happy to try and answer. Now, how many passengers would it take? Right, so th it was modified to take two. Normally, it was built to carry a gunner in the back. Yeah. Um, but they made a sort of rearward facing bench seat for two but actually you could squeeze somebody else on the luggage rack if they're facing <laughs> forwards and there is a, um, a record of a, uh, an SOE agent operating the Far East that was evacuated by Lysander 
There were five in the back. <laughs> but they were smaller people. Because <laughs> <laughs> you weren't going far. <laughs> very friendly. Yeah. With the high wing, how does it handle with, with cross wings and landing? Um, it's not too bad, except that big, such a high aeroplane in the crosswind it tends to roll and sort of t feels like it's going to tip over, but doesn't. But it's sort of slightly disconcerting. But it's, it's okay. Um, the worst thing is the, the brakes are air brakes, and they have a limited um, energy absorption. And all, all the brakes at that time in the 30s were the same. The brakes were designed to help you stop when you're taxiing, and uh, uh, rather than stop the landing. And so they run out of energy very quickly, and, and we call them brake fade, and they stop working. So because aeroplanes always want to point into wind, that's their job, when you're landing in a crosswind, the aeroplane's trying to turn into the wind the whole time, so you're using one brake all the time to stop it, and eventually that runs out of energy, and then you can't stop it turning into wind, the brake stops working. So that becomes the limit. Huh. What's the um, I think it depends on the cloud. I think that probably about 5,000 would be ideal to give them a reasonable view. Um, but um, they want to be able to see the ground, so they would fly lower if the cloud would be quite high.